Greetings, my brothers and sisters, and welcome back to Disciple Talk on this Thanksgiving week we're entering in. Well, let me first say to everyone, to our church family and to those who partake of the Disciple Talk Bible study who are not formal uh, disciples here, happy Thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for in the midst of God keeping us, in the midst of him protecting us, in the midst of him being with us, for our families, for all the good things that we can put our minds on. I just wanna take a moment to say to the First Congregational Church family, have a happy Thanksgiving. As you gather with family and friends, as you enjoy a wonderful meal, but most importantly, giving thanks to the one who created the day created the years, created everything, and has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So I exhort you, give thanks, be thankful, and let's keep walking by faith and not by sight. Well, we're going to continue today in the study of the gospel of the kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom of of God. And this, this will be part two in the discipleship teaching series. But as you know, I've been dealing with this topic on each Sunday service at the glorious Sunday worship services as well. So what we're trying to do on with discipleship is to provide more amplification and explanation of this great theme of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And over the last two weeks on Sundays, we've been dealing with the miracles of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus. And Jesus did all kinds of miracles when he manifested his ministry. We, we gave out a handout that had 37 of his miracles that are recorded in the New Testament. Jesus did miracles of deliverance from possession. He did miracles that dealt with food and nature. He did, did miracles of raising people from the dead. He did miracles of healings, which was a predominant part of his miraculous work when he walked the earth. But this past Sunday, we continued to deal with Jesus's miracles as they related to him dealing with evil spirits and demonic activity. And on this past Sunday, we highlighted Jesus' miraculous deliverance of the Gadarene demoniac. The Gadarene demoniac, which is recorded in Matthew 8, 28 and 33, in Mark 5, 120, and in Luke 8, 26 through 39. There are three gospels that record this account of Jesus miraculously delivering a man that had sunk to living lower than an animal when he walked on the earth. And the bottom line is the scripture says that after Jesus had ministered to him, he, put, he, he was back in his right mind. He put his clothes on. He was returned back to a purpose and his family and began to be a great witness for Jesus Christ. I want to go further today because there are other aspects of Jesus's miraculous work in the area of dealing with evil spirits and demonic activity that I want to highlight in Disciple Talk. And I want to make sure we take the time to biblically look at this. Now, let me begin by talking about the nature of demons, the nature of demons. One thing we know about demon spirits or evil spirits is that the Bible calls them unclean. That simply means they are devoid of the righteousness of God. They are devoid of anything that is good and right and leads to what God's will would have you to fulfill. They are unclean. The Old Testament also talks about these evil spirits as being called familiar spirits because they actually can deceive you by thinking that they are speaking for God or imitating the Holy Spirit, but yet they are a familiar spirit, but not the true work of the Holy Spirit. Thus, the nature of demons is always to deceive, to destroy, to kill, all these things. That's the ultimate nature of evil 
and demonic activity. Just recently, this week, we read and hear about a man who plows a truck into a crowd of Christmas parade people up in Wisconsin. He just uh, drives a truck, kills five people and injures minimal by driving his vehicle straight into a crowd of people attending the Christmas parade. Now, it says he was doing this on the heels of some anger after a domestic dispute. It is also revealed that he has a history of violent behavior in regard to his past record. Thus, I've been saying even this Sunday that demonic activity is behind more things than we would like for it to think. And one of the things that evil and demonic activity can do is take advantage of people who can't control their emotions, especially if it's a long-term pattern in their life and they constantly allow their emotions to take over them. This is an avenue and a doorway for demonic activity. And I want to say on record, this man who drove this car into these innocent people who had nothing to do with his domestic issue that precipitated this, I believe he was influenced by demonic activity. Now, I want to be on record on saying that because the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But all demon spirits, evil spirits, are not violent. And that's something we got to understand. There are violent ones. There are some so violent that right now they're still chained under the authority of Jesus Christ and cannot do anything. But there are other demon spirits or evil spirits loose in the earth right now, but they are not necessarily outwardly violent. And that's what I want to talk about today because I think this is the greatest challenge for churches today by spirits or evil spirits, demon spirits, and I like to characterize them as being scheming and divisive. You know, scheming and divisive. And this is why in Ephesians, it talks about be strong in the Lord, that sixth chapter, and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor, verse 11, season 6, 10, 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. Now that word schemes means plans, crafted, planned out, schematic. It is organized. It is, it is deliberate, but it has a, a, a laid out strategy of attack. And that's what I want to deal with today because some of these demon spirits or evil spirits that influence and seek to cause disunity in the church are working overtime in these last days, especially in light of a pandemic when people can't come together. There are all kind of conversations going on, back alley telephone calls, you name it. And the enemy can use these demonic spirits or evil spirits to put things in the minds of people in the church. Should we come back? Should we not come back? How should we deal with this? All this kind of stuff, and it leads to the church not being unified. I think this is one of the greatest challenges churches are facing in this post-pandemic time. So I want to deal with this biblically. The Bible is clear that one of the most uh, uh, prevalent characteristics of evil and demonic spirits that are not necessarily violent or manifest themselves through violence is that they manifest themselves through lying and deception. If you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 18, we'll see an account in the life of the nation of Israel as it relates to King Ahab of Israel at that time in regard to the activity of a lying spirit or evil spirit, but his, his mode of operation is through lying and deception. Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 18, then Micah said, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and his left. And the Lord said, who will persuade King Ahab, king of Israel, to go up 
that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead. So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner. Now look at verse 20. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? Look at verse 21. So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Verse 22. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Then Zedekiah, the son of Kena, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, which way did the spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, I indeed you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. Listen, this brief account through the words recorded in 2 Chronicles 18 through 23, 24, reveal that there are evil spirits whose main manifestation is through lying and deception. Now, if you don't know the background of this text, you would think the Lord is promoting lying and deception, but that's not the case. The background is that King Ahab, who became one of the most wicked kings Israel ever had, was rebelling against the Lord. His rebellion was so set against the word of God and the prophets of God that then he had given himself over to a direction and opposition to the will of God. And here we see an account where because of Ahab's opposition to the will of God, he sealed his own fate by the Lord allowing an evil spirit to speak to the prophets, to King Ahab, that would continue to lead him to his utter destruction. The reason the Lord allowed it was because his heart was already set against God. And my brothers and sisters, there comes a time if you don't stand for what's right, you will be deluded, deceived, primarily through evil spirits, to stand for a lie. This is what we see in this account in 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verses 18 through 24. Now, make no mistake about it. The Lord doesn't tempt anybody, according to James. The Lord doesn't tell a lie. He can't lie. But what he can do with his sovereignty and his understanding of his eternal plan and will he will allow people to listen to evil spirits because they've already chosen to go that way. And the lying spirit that came to King Ahab through his prophets was God's judgment to allow him to go forward under the own deception that he had already embraced to his ultimate doom and destruction. Now, this is important because in the church today, we're dealing with this as never before in these last days. I think every church is under attack. And I, again, go back to the pandemic has caused more division in the church than ever before. Now, when I say division, I mean uh, uh, the unity of the church has been challenged because the pandemic affected us in regard to gatherings, in regard to direction, in regard to how we will go forward, how we will do this, how we will do that. And in the midst of that, there's only one thing that can give us the direction we need, and that is the word of God as illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And if churches stick with the Bible, that's where their unity is. And listening to the Holy Spirit, that's the one who confirms in the church the direction and the decisions and everything that has to be made. Our unity is in the word of God as we follow Jesus under the leading of the Holy Spirit. But this challenge today is a, an attack by demonic evil and evil spirits, demonic evil, whatever you want to call it, to divide the church. 
to, to keep the church at odds with each other. And thus, I want to show you some other scriptures that prove this point, because I believe this is the major attack in the church today of this issue of divisiveness among leaders, people in the pew, even in your home, on your job. It has per, per, perpetuated itself. And thus, the goal of this teaching is to identify when it is of evil spirits or demonic activity. Listen to what Paul told the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 28, Paul meeting with the Ephesian elders or pastors and leaders of the church in Ephesus at that time, before he would leave, listen to what his warning was. He says in verse 28, 27, Acts 20, 27, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. First, take heed to yourself. Make sure you're right. And to all the flock, the church, among which who? The Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. He's talking to the pastors of the churches of Ephesus. First thing, take heed to yourself. Make sure you are, are right within yourself. Number two, and to the flock. Watch over the flock. Protect the flock for which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now look at the warning Paul gives to the pastors. For I know this, verse 29, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, there's the attack from outside. That's, in our terms today, that's the world coming in, telling us sexual sin is okay. That's, that's the culture trying to prioritize its priorities in the church. That's politics trying to guide the church in our contemporary time. Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, these savage wolves will come in saying they're Christians, saying they want to talk to the church. But not only from the attackers from the outside, look at verse 30, and from among yourselves, from within the church, within the local fellowship, men will rise up speaking Perverse things, lies, wrong things, false narratives, trying to paint a picture that's not true for whatever motives they have. Here it is, verse 30. And from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things. And what's the goal? To draw away disciples after themselves. We want to lead some people astray. We want to lead people away from the focus. We want to lead people away from the true path of following Jesus Christ. There it is. And from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things, wicked things, off-base things, unbiblical things. They'll put the emphasis on the wrong thing to draw away disciples after themselves. And 31, therefore watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So then, brothers and sisters, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Now, what did Paul say? Get, keep you straight. The word, the word of God, the word of his grace, because these people want to draw you away. They're not going to use the Bible. If they do, they're going to misquote it and misinterpret it. But he said, I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to to build you up, that's unity, that's togetherness, that's edification, that's spiritual growth. Build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified or set apart in Jesus Christ. So one of the things we got to recognize, your greatest defense against lying and deceptive evil spirits or demonic activity is your love for the truth. Your love for the truth and your inner desire to be a sincere follower of Jesus Christ. You don't have no hidden agendas. You're not trying this to do anything in the church for selfish motives. If you have selfish motives, if you're disgruntled, 
This is the way lying spirits find a way into influencing the church through discontentment, disgruntlement, through, through, through just this agitation of the pandemic, all the stress and the strain. Things come to your mind that ain't of God and you start thinking it is of God. That's why you got to watch out for all this folk talking about something dropped in my spirit. Listen, I want to hear what's in your, what you read in the Bible, not what dropped in your spirit out the air somewhere. I want to hear what though you read in the Bible that directs you. Be careful. Believe not every spirit, 1 John says. Don't believe anything you hear. Put your faith in what's written in the word of God. So this issue of lying spirits, deceptive spirits, demons that operate not violently, but under the cover of scheming and divisive is pervasive in the church today. And that's why pastors have to have discernment. And you're looking at one who has the gift of discernment. He'll show you things before they come to pass. He'll reveal things to you just so you'll know. And then with everything about it, it'll just show itself for what it is. Let me prove what I'm saying to you. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Here it is, plain as day. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, we see the pattern of demonic and evil spirits that are not violent, but scheming and deceptive. Here it is, 1 Timothy 4. Now the Holy Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Some will depart from what they used to believe. They will depart from biblical belief, but though they come to church, though they're active in the church. Listen, they will depart from the faith. Why will they depart? Here it is. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. This same thing that happened to King Ahab back in 2 Chronicles chapter 18. He, because his heart was off anyway, he believed the lying spirits through the prophets when they spoke to him because his heart won't set on the truth. Same thing today, my brothers and sisters. If your heart ain't set on the truth, you will depart from the faith. You will give heed to, here it is, deceiving spirits and the teachings of demons. That's it right there. Where is this taking place? Right in the middle of God's church. Right in the middle of local churches. And First Congregational is not exempt. It's the midst. It's the way. It's what's happening around the world right now in the church. People are either going to follow the truth or they're going to follow a lie. Hear me well. That's a principle. You will either follow the truth or you will believe a lie. There's no middle ground. So look at what it says. The Holy Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. That's what's happening in local churches. It even can happen in congregational church. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and the teachings of demons. And what else does it lead to? They'll speak lies in hypocrisy. They know they're lying. They know what they're saying ain't true, but they got a false narrative that they're trying to promote. So if you don't fit into the false narrative, their hypocrisy, smiling in your face, talking about you behind your back, will lead to them lying. Lie, lies in, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Meaning they so bent on going the wrong way that their heart has become seared or scarred and they can't even feel or sense that they're doing the wrong thing. This is what happens when you give yourself over to not loving the truth. I want to give you the last one in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. This is the point. If you don't stand for the truth, you will stand for the lie. Listen to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want to kind of go, if you read the whole chapter, but I want to go down to verse 8. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And then the lawless one, meaning the Antichrist, will be revealed 
whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. I've been telling you on Sundays that when Lucifer rebelled up in heaven, Jesus said he saw him fall like lightning. Now, even though he's still active in this fallen world, there's coming a time when he will manifest himself through the lawless one, and Jesus' power will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. Look at verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is in according to the working of who? Satan, the father of lies. Is that right? He is the father of lies and deception with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all righteous deception among those who perish. Now get this, my brothers and sisters, why do they perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Hear me, you don't want the truth, you're going to believe the lie. Look at the next verse, verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they may believe the lie and that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. My brothers and sisters, that same thing happened in 2 Chronicles chapter 18 with Ahab. He sent a strong delusion because their heart was set on the lie to start with. Hear me well, First Congregational. Make sure you love the truth. Make sure you're standing for the truth. So the lying spirit, the deceptive spirits, not the ones that cause a lot of physical violence, but the ones who want to lead the church astray and destroy the unity of the church. This is a demonic attack. This is what evil spirits are doing. Hear me well. Listen. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they may believe the lie, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here's the point. If you don't stand for the truth, you're going to believe the lie. The main strategy and scheme against the unity of the local church is to use deception and lying to destroy unity. And my brothers and sisters, I hope you hear my prophetic warning to all of us and to all churches. Believe the truth, love the truth, stand for the truth, and you'll be able to discern the lies of demonic spirits and evil and demonic spirits activity around you in your life, in your family, in your workplace, and my Lord, even in your church. Be encouraged because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Be warned, love the truth, and you can spot the lie. Well, this is Pastor Smith, and I want to tell you again, happy Thanksgiving. Give him the glory for all he's done. See you next week on the next Disciple Talk Bible Study.